Hi, everybody. I'm Josh, and I'm thrilled to welcome all of you to this Lost Anniversary Fan Q&A. Fan questions about Lost. What can possibly go wrong, right? This is going to be bumpier than Oceanic Flight 815, safe to say. Yes, remarkably, it's been 10 years since the epic conclusion to the show that changed TV forever, and 10 years later, we are no less obsessed. Joining me today for this therapy session, I mean Q&A, are showrunners Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse. Gentlemen. Hello, it Josh. It's a pleasure. Hi there, Josh. Well, I'm applauding you. Here I am. Um, welcome, guys. Uh, this is going to be fun. Um, Damon, isn't this why you got rid of Twitter to avoid answering questions like this? Is this a bad call on your part? I'm sorry. I was told that I would be asking the questions and that you would be answering them. So uh, <laughs> I, no I in no, no way, I'm, I don't think I'm really in a position to answer any questions today. <laughs> so this is going to be very awkward. Carlton, what's the uh, what's the one question I need to skip today? What's the one that's going to break your brain in half and make you just walk off? Um, who are the people in the other outrigger? That's it. I'm just going to get up and I'm going to storm out of frame, and um, that's that, that that you just have to take that one out of the pile and and burn it. I might I might put you to the test, sir. I'm I'm afraid I, I have I have my duties. I have to serve the fans. Wow. Um, just, just a note: we are taping this on September 22nd, the date Oceanic Flight 815 went down. Um, I don't know how, how to feel about that. Is this just another bit of kismet, fate, just dumb luck? How are you feeling about the fact that we're doing this on this day in particular? Um, good, <laughs> really good. <laughs> did, the date, did the date of that did the date in the show mean anything to you guys? Was it just an arbitrary, like, pulled it out of a hat? I think it was the date that the show premiered. I think it actually premiered on the 22nd. And so, like, we we felt like that would be the designation when the audience saw Oceanic 815 crash. That would be the date because time moved much differently on the island, both literally and figuratively. But so this right. the, the time between episodes one and two of Lost or the pilot in episode one, as we called it at the time, was about 30 seconds, but for the audience, it was a week. And so instantly island time started moving differently, but that was the one place where everybody synchronized your watches, you know, <laughs> uh, September 22nd, that the moment that the, the plane crashed is actually happening live for you uh, somewhere in the world. And uh, on September 22nd, Carlton and I were, I think over at JJ's house, with a group yeah. of the actors and writers and um and and for a premiere party um on a Wednesday night. So uh that's where that's where we were when Oceanic A15 went down. And so we have an alibi is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I uh the the rest of these questions, that was my own my sole question. The rest of these are from the fans. So blame them, don't blame me. Some of these are very serious, some of these are very stupid. It's like drive shafts, oeuvre, it's a little bit of everything. So we're just going to dive right in, shall we? Okay. Are we starting serious or stupid, Josh? Uh, let's see. This first one is kind of sentimental. Let's go in the oh. middle, okay? okay. This is, let's, go to, let's go to our first video question, if we can. Oh, we can't hear you. Uh, we can't hear oh, it. Oh, thank God, that's what really I was like. of the show would you say you're most proud of? What? Okay, so <laughs> I, I, I can translate for our, our, our friend in, in the basement in Pulp Fiction. It was, uh, what aspects of the show are you most nostalgic about 10 years ago? Oh, wow. I mean, I guess for me, it's the whole experience of traveling down to Hawaii and then, um, you know, sort of getting picked up at the airport and, the and going out to the North Shore and being in the incredible physical beauty in which we shot the show. There was something that was really transformative about that, actually. Um, you know, while the show, you know, a good television show hopefully transports you to the environment you're creating in the show, but physically we were transported and we would go down there and it was really amazing. And then you're on the, we're on this beautiful beach uh, or uh, up in the jungles and, uh, on the on the east side of the island and it was that that was something that, that i really missed and was really special yeah you, Damon, what do you what do you think back to yeah 
first on off, I, I think that we, and I know that I speak for Carlton when I say this, need to celebrate how awesome that question asker looked. We missed his name because <laughs> his audio was out, but wherever he got that mask, I suspect it was fan made. And I think that, I think that's kind of my, my primary answer to the question is that the interaction with the fans, and that's not just yeah. because we're in, in a, in the format of a very strange con right now, but I grew up in, in convention culture before it exploded back when it was a thing that you, I would say to my dad, how do you even know this thing is happening? How did all these, before the internet, the idea of like, how does, how do all these weird people know to show up at this hotel? Like where, to, and they brought their tables and their comic books and there's James Dewan from Star Trek and a bunch of, there's no air conditioning. And so I grew up in this culture. And so that moment when Carlton and I and the cast members came out on the stage in Hall H after the first season, was, after Lost was really out there. And that was that summer between season one and season two which would I, I would basically sort of felt to me like it was the, you know, it was that montage in movies in eighties movies where just everything is going right. And all the magazine covers are spinning and, you know, we're the best around, nothing's going to ever keep you down. You know, that kind of thing is happening. <laughs> we, we, um, we, when we walked out on that stage and the fans were lined up at the mics, I just couldn't believe that I was the one answering the questions. And, and then, but, but then we would, on subsequent years, we would go down and like hang, hang out in the lines, you know, with the fans the night before. And so that idea of like, that we were fans who had now made something that had fans and we were kind of all in it together. Like that, that experience is the thing that I feel the most nostalgia for. Um, in addition to obviously seeing and, and feeling and missing all the people that we made the show with. But that that part of it, I think, is pretty spectacular. Uh, our next question comes from Mara M on Twitter. Uh, if Lost was a 2020 show, what would you have written differently, anything to change? So, I mean, this, this came up in a bunch of questions, and I feel like it is a good question because you guys have both created shows subsequently for streaming services, for cable services, where there are less restrictions, where there's a finite episode order from the start. Do you think back to Lost and think it would have been a markedly different show if you were creating it for Prime or HBO or Netflix and had less restrictions? I don't know. You know, I think that that um, the restrictions, in a way, were part of what defined the content. I mean, particularly the act breaks in network television. And we wrote to those act breaks. And so when we were designing stories, it was always about What's going to make a great teaser out? What's going to make a great act one out? What's going to make a great episode out that's going to make people come back next week? And I think the format of network television with the commercial breaks was so um, central to the construction of the show that, um, you know, I, I it, it kind of really helped make the show what it was in, in, a, in a way. I, I think the one thing, so I don't know that having the freedom of just episodes playing without commercial breaks um, would have been better. I mean, at least for me, I think the one thing was language. Um, I, it felt sometimes a little restrictive that, you know, you have a very limited vocabulary of exclamation work words in, um, network television. And it's funny, if you read the scripts, they're full of F bombs. I mean, because what we ended up doing, because we couldn't say certain things on screen, we sort of wrote them into the description. So it's like, oh, and then they, see a fucking hatch and oh my fucking god what the fuck is in that thing and so we tried to convey the intensity in the scripts in order to get the actress to try to convey the intensity when all they could say was damn right which which character would have had the, the biggest potty mouth is i feel like sawyer has a, a quite a lexicon quite a uh, quite an assembly of four letter words he calls upon certainly sawyer would have had a a, a um, a, a more colorful vernacular than he already had. But I think that there were just certain instances on the show, like Dr. Arched blowing up that would have like called for Hurley to just say shit, <laughs> you know, or <laughs> Jesus Christ. Like, it just like that, you know, that's just what any, any real person would say in that moment. I remember 
when I went to go see Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, there's that moment where Harrison Ford runs out on the rope bridge and he looks and there's thuggies coming at him from both sides. And he just says, shit. And it was the first time that I heard that word in a movie. And I turned to my dad and I said, did they have that word in 1935? And, he, and like, it just was, it, it was so right for, for the characters to do that. And I, I, I don't know. I, um, uh, I would just say that, um, I agree with Carlton. I think that, you know, we can spend all the time in the world saying, oh, it would have been great. I, I think that we both agree. And certainly we were able to manifest this for the back for, epi for seasons four, five, and six, that the best version of Lost would have been maybe 13 to 15 episodes a season. It would have, yeah. we, it, it, you know, there would have been a lot less filler and there would have been a lot more control in terms of, you know, r when we were running out of flashbacks and, I think a lot more confidence in the storytelling. There were just Jack always would moments. Never have, yeah. Jack would never have flown a kite on the beach in Thailand. Never. But maybe he had to fly that kite, Carlton, <laughs> for us to, wow. like, I, I'm, you're right. I, at least that's what I keep telling Bai Lee. <laughs> she, she's, on my, <laughs> she's on my phone sheet again. No, it's, um, it, you know, I, it, 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 I wouldn't have it any other way. And I feel like Lost wouldn't have been lost if if it had been made in 2020. Certainly, um, you know, a, a lot of things about the show were very specifically speaking to the time that it was made in. And um, it, if it were happening in 2020, I think that there are just so many distractions. Um, uh, we, we probably would have been more prone to be on a soapbox and Lost wasn't really a soapbox show. Desmond would have had much stronger feelings about vaccinating himself down there in the hatch. Um, and, and quarantine would have taken on an entirely different meaning, but, you know, uh, like it, it was able to be what it was because of when it was on and, you know, you kind of, I'm not, I'm not gonna, gonna travel back in time and, and, and change, create that paradox. What happened happened let's, as they, as, a, as, a, as they once say. Let's try another, uh, video question. Hopefully you guys will be able to hear this one. Roll it. Hi, I was wondering whether you have any theories or headcanons that you choose to believe, even if they weren't in the show. For example, I like to believe that Hugo runs a golf tournament every single year now that he's in charge of the island. Thanks. Oh my God, Australian first off, awesome. <laughs> oh. Do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, I, yeah go for I it, just want to just say, I, officially, because I think you and I are in a position to do this, we can verify her theory that in fact, Hugo is having a yearly invitational that's it's called the Dharma Open, and uh, it's 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 invitation only, um, and uh, that is a thing that is in fact accurate. So I think we can starts, we can it, basically yeah we can, we it can starts say with true. the fourth round and then it <laughs> finishes with the first round. Wow, I like that. It's a little little time travel thing there. I don't know. I'm trying to think of can. like. Have, I'm trying to think if I've heard any theories. Um, uh, like, I, oh, I heard a theory. Someone tried to explain to me once that Jack was his own dad, that Christian Shepherd was Jack. But I was like, but Jack dies when he's, you know, a 42-year-old man. Um, so how could he grow up to be Christian Shepherd? And they had an answer for that. Um, and I was like, I wish, boy, I that's... wish you wouldn't put this conversation that we had between ourselves public. I mean, I think it was <laughs> yes. better for us to just have had that conversation yeah. just it was, between ourselves. <laughs> it was, it was Carlton's theory. Um, but, uh, I, I wish it were true, Carlton. You were so <laughs> baked when you said, when you came up with that one. <laughs> Whatever, Damon. <laughs> so judgy. <laughs> what, what, um, here's a question from DJ Dom. Forget the talk of a Damon Carlton TV reunion. I want a new podcast. You guys were at the forefront. So is this a soft reboot today? Are you guys ready to launch a podcast together and will it be about Lost? Or what, what other shared interests could you fill an hour a week on? Well, see, that's the problem. It's a topic. Like, Lost was a very good topic. And it was actually the funnest part of our week. And probably... One of the big reasons that we were excited about doing this with you, Josh, because we had so much fun. The funnest part of the podcast was answering the crazy, reverent, and funny fan questions at the end of it. And, you know, it was really hard making the show, especially in the first, well, all the seasons were hard. I mean, let's, you know, it was hard. And, but during the podcast, we laughed. We had a great time. It was kind of, it was like, 
it was sort of our R and R during the course of the week, and I miss it, and it was fantastic. But um, we just we we do need a topic, so. Yeah, I would just say that the one thing that I think we can all agree upon is there's not enough podcasts out there right now. (laughs) Um, And there's a part of me that feels like duty bound to just kind of make sure that there's enough content. Um, So if we could figure out what what the subject matter was, we would certainly jump at it. I just always remember what how we reacted when we were first told, do you want to do a podcast? And we were like, that sounds like the nerdiest thing ever. What what is that even? Like who's who cares? The only thing that really existed at the time was the Ricky Gervais podcast, which was almost it it had an organic improv quality, but it almost felt scripted and it was performed by professional comedians, you know, Ricky Gervais and and Stephen Merchant and Carl Pilkinson and um like Plinkington Polkington, one of those guys. But anyway, it was sort of like who but le- okay, we'll do this thing. And, and it was just so odd when it began to develop its own sort of little fandom. Um, and we realized that the questions we were getting were from people who were actually listening to the podcast. There was, in addition to everything that Carlton just said about it, there's just a freedom in saying like everything that we're saying, there's only like eight people who are listening to it. Um, and uh, that's, that's what made it such a hoot. To be fair, looking at your home setup, Damon, I feel like you are living a life as a podcaster. You look like you're, uh, I mean, I don't know, you're like Joe Rogan in there. You have the whole setup. You're ready to go. <laughs> uh, I, I've never been more proud of myself than to be compared to uh, to Joe Rogan. And don't try to steal my peewee bike. I, I, I don't even try. Uh, let's go to the next video question, if we could. Let's roll it. What do you think was the saddest death on loss? Now, you two ha- are devoid of human emotions, so this might be tough for you, but <laughs> assuming you have that capability. Probably the guy Saeed shot on the golf course. That, Come on. That was... <laughs> the guy. The guy in The Economist. <laughs> uh, there were a lot of sad deaths. Uh, I mean, Charlie, obviously. I mean, they're all sad. They were all sad. It was really sad when we lost all of the characters i i it's very hard to pick one um i'll, I'll say that the the charlie death definitely i think is always going to be my number one just just when you know jack bender directed that episode and dominic monahan was in a tank giving that performance um and when we got the dailies back it was like oh my god this is like just gut wrenching, and then we went to the the music stage and saw what Michael Giacchino had done with that sequence. So it was like we watched Charlie die fifty times, and every single time it still hurt. But the I, one that I gets... remember when we were going, I remember going into the editing room and watching it cut the first time, and we watched it happen. And I remember we were like, "Oh, we are such shitheads." Yeah, they're gonna hate <laughs> we us. Were, we were just we're like, "What did we do?" They're gonna hate us. But the one that gets me every, you know, I like, I've only rewatched certain episodes of the show maybe once because my wife and son just watched, just binged the entire series. So my wife, Heidi, rewatched it and my son watched it with her. Um, and they did it over the course of maybe eight months, watched all six seasons. And so I would kind of poke my head in and just watch with them sometimes before they were like, get out of here. Like you're ruining it. Cause I'd be like, Oh, this is, there's an interesting story behind this one. They'd be like, stop it. You're ruining it. But when Sun and Jin die in the final season together, the performances that Daniel and Yunjin give. And again, it's another, you know, the water is like, you know, is, 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 is like overwhelming them. I like, it wrecked me in a way that I like, I was really experiencing it as a viewer as opposed to someone who was directly complicit and responsible for murder. Um, and uh, it was deeply and profoundly affecting. Man, I, I'm really regretting stopping watching after the first season. I feel like you, you just ruined so much of the show for me today. <laughs> this was a really bad call hosting this one. Jesus. Well, you um, I'm sure someone told you before you even agreed to do this that they were dead the whole time. So really no death. <laughs> In and of itself, what is that not accurate, Carlton? Don't, don't listen. Don't no. Don't listen to him. No. No. Agree to disagree. I've heard. 
I've heard that too. Never listen to Damon. Mm -hmm. um, I, I promise uh, more stupid questions are coming, but we have a semi-serious, I believe, video question before we get to the dumbness. Uh, let's go for it. One more video question. Hey guys, uh, Michael Emerson was only supposed to be on the show for a couple of episodes before you upgraded him to a series regular, and he ended up being, you know, the main villain of the show for a really long time. Uh, if he hadn't come along, what were your plans for, you know, a leader of the others or kind of any of the pieces of the story that he ended up touching? Great question. Uh, Carlton, you, yeah. you, you start. Um, first of all, you know, I, I think when you, to make a television show successful, you really have to listen to the show and the show, um, you know, tells you what it wants to be. And in the case of Michael Emerson, it was, you know, we had this idea that he would be the leader of the others, but we also had a sort of a backup plan that if it didn't work, he would be, he wouldn't be the leader of the others. He would just be a guy who escapes, who they catch and who, you know, escapes and then goes away. And then Emerson came on the show and he was so good. I remember when he said, um, you know, uh, God, got any milk, just, got any milk. Yeah. And we were watching the, we were watching that together and we were like, holy shit, this guy is amazing. And he went from doing three episodes in the second season to doing eight episodes. And then it seemed inconceivable that the show could exist without him. And that was just us kind of leaning into this, this gold vein. It was like mining, you know, we just were like, oh my God, this guy is so good. Um, I, I think there, at some point there would have been a leader of the others, but if it wasn't Michael Emerson, it, it, would have been someone else, but it's hard. It seems inconceivable now that anybody else could have been the leader of the others besides Michael Emerson. But, um, you know, the show, the show took its own twists and turns as, as it went on and, you know, cast, um, came and went and, um, Emerson earned his way in. And I think also the void that was created by, um, Ottawale, Kenue Abaje kind of deciding that he didn't really like being on the show and didn't want to be around. And so we wrote him, wrote him out and that created a bunch more space for Michael Emerson. So it's kind of a, more of a circumstantial thing. Got it. Um, Kate Crumrine wants to know if Justin Theroux, Kevin Garvey, Regina King's, Angela Abar, Freddie Highmore's, Norman Bates, or John Krasinski's Jack Ryan were on the island, how would they fare? Oh, wow. Wow, mashup. <laughs> um... <laughs> It's, uh, it's, uh, it's so hard to imagine. It depends on if they, if they were there from the very, very beginning or if they came in, in in subsequent seasons. I mean, everybody that you just named anchors their own show. So I think that there would be, um, there would, there would be a lot of sort of like infighting for dominance. Um, and I think more along the lines of like, who would fall into like what camp, you know, if you're saying like there's camp Jack and camp Locke. Um, you know, where do those, where do those designated people go? But the problem is that certainly in the case of Angela Abar, she would say, I, I choose neither. I'm forming my own camp and it'll be over here. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, uh, and Kevin Garvey and, and Jack Shepard had a lot in common in that, uh, they both cry a lot and question their own <laughs> leadership abilities. <laughs> Sounds like someone we know. And, uh, um, but I, I, th that's me speaking for, for, for my two characters. Uh, I think there would be sort of an epic battle between Krasinski and the smoke monster. Not <laughs> sure who would win that. Um, and Freddie Highmore in his kind of slow, in his kind of quiet, unassuming manner would probably become the leader of the island. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be a good other, a natural, maybe our backup plan for Emerson. He would, I know, exactly. Kind of quietly, but very stealthily maneuvering himself into power. Uh, short but sweet question from Jez Loves Music. Is time travel a bitch to write? <laughs> oh my yes. God. Yeah, the short, the short answer is yes. I think what it would take us, like, how long to do an average episode of the show, Damon? Like, to break an episode? Uh, you know... Uh, but but about a week and a half of of room days. So it's like blank, constant... blank mord Monday, Wednesday, following Wednesday, full boards, and then yeah. the constant was I think about seven weeks, like yeah. something. So like that. we we chewed up this entire chunk of story breaking real estate trying to do that one episode that 
put us horribly behind and out of sorts because it was just so hard to crack. Um, my head actually hurts just hearing your question. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's two forms of, of time travel storytelling. One is that when you travel back in time, you can change it. So that's back to the future, right? Like, oh, I prevented my parents from getting together and now I might not exist. And then there's the other version, which is you travel back in time, but everything you do there has already been done. And and that that way is much more time consuming, pun intended, because every butterfly that you step on, you have to have already solved for. Like, so you can't, you can't create any paradoxes. And so our entire, the, the entirety of the Dharma season where they traveled back in time of the Dharma times was, was basically saying that everything that they have, that they're going to do here ha already has been preordained um, versus that they, that we, we as storytellers can kind of do whatever we want. And that just makes your story choices. You have to, you have to approach it with a great d degree of delicacy and lost and delicate were not like we're not we're strange bedfellows i think that the kind of storytelling that we like to do is like let's just let's just go and trash this place and we'll we'll clean it up tomorrow you can't you can't do that when it comes to time travel um this this is safe to say my favorite question of uh our q a it's gonna be hard to top warren belknap wants to know would you say you're more of a nikki or a paolo <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> oh gosh um definitely apollo really oh for sure and i'll i, I think it goes without being say saying but i'll say it anyway definitely for me nikki um uh because i like the attention and the stripper pole and i'll just say we have to shout out i i, th I would assume that people know this that josh's brother adam is one half of the team Kitsis and Horowitz, Adam Adam Horowitz is, and, and and Eddie Kitsis, and they were on Lost from basically the 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 most of season one all the way until the finale, and were the architects of so many incredible moments on the show um, that so many to name, but the you know the Dharma van and 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 almost everything relating to Hurley and Charlie had had their uh, wonderful fingerprints on it, but that that episode expose in which Nikki and Paolo were, were finally dispatched was, uh, was an, uh, was an Eddie and Adam fastball. And, uh, one of my favorite episodes, because it was, as Carlton was talking before, the show tells you what it wants to be. And if the show isn't, if you're ignoring the show, the fans will tell you and Nikki and Paolo, it was like that moment in the gladiator arena where everybody was like, and what we all understood we can't do that thing where the characters just cease to exist, where you just don't show them anymore. We have to make an entire episode about it, like sort of acknowledging the error of our ways and then making sure that these characters never drew breath again. And, but and so it, re it required a, a tonal balance that Eddie and Adam were really like, I mean, if I were left to my own devices, there'd be no humor in any show that I ever worked on. And, and, um, and so that life, that absurdity, the, you know, that sense of pathos and humanity through humor, um, and caring and understanding was like Eddie and Adam and, you know, just two of the incredible writers, um, that we worked with sort of wire to wire, but not just saying this because you are a biological relative of them, but the, the, I can't imagine what the show would have been without those guys. Just one of them. He's, I don't think you're related to Eddie. I mean, if you are, that's a whole other podcast. I can't believe you revealed my personal connection. Um, now this whole journalistic exercise, this hard hitting expose is compromised. My integrity is shot. Thanks, David. It, is, is, have I outed the? Uh, have I outed the, the 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 relationship? I thought it was like yeah. I, I thought no, it was, we, we could we, we keep it Wikipedia. A okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're you're booted off the Once Upon a Time panel. I'm doing next too. Oh um, boy. Okay, Robin E. Jeffrey wants to know. Please ask who their favorite totally obscure character is. Oh, so, great! One question. that you obsessed over. You still obsess over. That's a great question. Do you wh um, where? Where is the where is the bar for obscurity? Like um, Neil, yeah, like Neil Frogert. <laughs> Neil Frogert, that, yeah. Also, Robin, uh, Robin mentioned Frogert. Yes. Oh wow! I think just because 
Eddie Kitsis was so obsessed with Neil Froger and was literally trying to like write him into the show. I mean, I think if Eddie had his way, he would have, you know, he, we would have left and he would have actually been the leader of the Island and not Hurley. Um, so I, I really enjoyed all of the diverse. Uh, Eddie had like worked out the entire backstory of Froger and his entire life and his entire journey. And it was just so much fun to actually talk about Froger instead of actually breaking story in the writer's room. Yeah, I, uh, he, um, there, I, I have, I have so many, um, I have so many favorites. I think Scott and Steve are classic, um, obscure characters. They were, they were socks, you know, background act of, of the original 48 survivors of, of, um, of Oceanic 815, but we could never keep straight which one of them was killed <laughs> by Ethan. And this sort of like became a running joke. And to this day, I don't, I'm, I, I think both of them were eventually killed, but the fact that we didn't never gave them last names or couldn't so, sort of couldn't, couldn't keep them straight at all. Um, that is, you know, I think that the, that, that I have to give the award to Scott or Steve, one of those two. I, I can't <laughs> even remember. I hadn't thought about that in a long time, but yeah, we'd be in the editing room and be like, is that Scott? He'd be like, no, that's Steve. And be like, absolutely, no, that is Scott. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, this is from Colin Rooney, who wants to know, apparently the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air heirs Carlton was named after Carlton Cuse. Can Carlton Cuse do the Carlton dance? Oh, boy. Uh, first of all, no, I can't, and no, I won't. So uh, that's <laughs> Would you do it for charity? Answer there. Uh, would you I, would you do it at for a million challenge. dollars yeah, to exactly. the charity of your choice? <laughs> <laughs> I'm I, I think I'm gonna I uh yes for that for charity I would work on it but I'm not prepared to demonstrate but uh, <laughs> it's something it's something I'm you know striving to to learn. I think I we'll speak back on to behalf you. of everyone watching this when I say give us the number we need to know <laughs> yes. we just we just need to know what the number is and then we can get to we can get to the kickstarting yeah. of okay. what will it take to get carlton cues to do the carlton dance with or without alfonso ribeiro but you have to confirm it is true you are that character yes, that is true andy and uh susan borowitz who created fresh prince of bel-air were classmates and friends of mine at harvard and uh expropriated my name to name this character so that is true and and ironically fresh prince was damon's nickname in high school it's bizarre <laughs> what a coincidence uh, it, is, it, it is it is a, <laughs> it is a coincidence <laughs> and untrue <laughs> um is it books by brooke wants to know <laughs> books by brooke wants to know do you think hurley left the island to go watch force awakens last jedi and the rise of skywalker if Ooh. so do you think he liked them Wow, that's a great question. As we know, um, Hurley wrote um, at least a draft of the uh, of the original trilogy, solving for certain aspects of the original trilogy that he did not like, um, uh, resulting in another Kitsis and Horowitz fastball, Some Like It Hoth, um, which is the title of that episode. Anyway, uh, I think that he did did he didn't need to leave the island to watch those uh movies he, he he has connections we'll just say he has connections um and uh as to whether or not he liked them hurley is a fan uh and as all fans are uh he loved all three movies and also wrote very lengthy essays on how deeply flawed they were <laughs> so um, I think that's uh, that's that that is keeping with uh, with fan culture and, and fan tradition. There's a meta level here involving JJ that I can't quite wrap my brain around. <laughs> it's kind of like when Stephen King wrote himself into the Dark Tower uh, yeah. books. Um, but um, <laughs> the fact that JJ Abrams co-created Lost and also worked on the Star Wars movies and that Hurley could watch them fries my brain a bit. But um, that's 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 my answer, and I'm sticking to it. Fair enough. Serial uh, Bowl Jim 108. Is Amy Goodspeed, Ethan's mother, in fact, Amelia Earhart and or the sweet old book club lady from A Tale of Two Cities? That's all I need to know until I come up with something else. Wow. <sighs> <laughs> well, 
Carlton? There's, you know, there's a lot, there's inspiration there. Uh, I don't know if we can, see, this is, this is, this is a tricky territory here. <laughs> I, I think we're just going to I want to go back. Point. I want to go back to Hurley, who I believe had we had another season would have discovered the Disney Plus hatch, and then he <laughs> could have easily watched those movies. That's amazing. <laughs> it was right over here the whole time. <laughs> um, Courtney Litz wants to know: uh, Charlotte wasn't allowed to have chocolate for dinner before dinner. What aren't you allowed to have before dinner? Oh wow. That's and that's like that's like Charlotte's last words before she has like a a chrono seizure taking her own life. So I feel like we're jinxed by even by even saying this. What am I uh what am I not allowed to have before dinner? I'd say happiness. I'm not allowed to have happiness before dinner. Happy 2020, everyone. I I really can't talk that. <laughs> Um, oh my Lord. I promised one super nerdy question to my friend and former colleague who I believe you both know, Josh Wiggler. Oh, Here wow. goes. This is, oh, this is a mouthful. Doozy. Yeah, seriously. Okay. Josh. Strap it. Strap in. This is not for me. This is the bad Josh. For a, long, for a long time, the whispers were associated with the others, at least in the minds of the fans. The whispers appear alongside the others as late as the second hour of the final season's two-part premiere. The final season, however, reveals that the Whispers are effectively ghosts of the islands, the ones who cannot move on. Is there still a connection between the Whispers and the others, though? Do the others and these ghosts work together for some mutual goal? Is that part of why Hurley, who can talk to ghosts, and then tell Walt in the lost epilogue that he can somehow help Michael, who is now one of the Whispers? Josh, if you want that to be true, it can, it's, can be true for you. <laughs> I I, I'm actually going to go out on a limb here and say that 80% of that question was actually discussed in the room. So this is one of those cases. I will say that there was the X factor that was not in a part of Josh's question was the monster itself and the idea that the monster was kind of a quasi ghost in the sense that it could take the form of the dead as it was reflected by the individuals that it was trying to um, uh, uh, ensnare, assault, intimidate, recruit, whatever. So J Jack saw his dad, and Echo saw Yemi, and so on. And, you know, Shannon saw Walt, who was not a. So the 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 fact that Ben Linus could control the monster, and that the monster was in some way responsible for the whispers as well. So the idea is that the whispers was sometimes the monster sometimes the actual ghosts of the island and sometimes just um like a, a horrific um story problem that we were trying to weasel our way out of but they were very very scary josh and that's what matters most because <laughs> whispers are scary you never know what people are saying about you behind your back unless you're on twitter <laughs> <laughs> um, Elizabeth Thompson has a question that's going to make Carlton walk, but I'll give it a twist. She wants to okay. know why will you guys never answer who was on the other Outrigger in season five? Is it something about this particular storyline? So she's not asking who's on there, but what's the deal? Why is it? Why does it set you guys off as something that you just don't even want to address? By the way, that's really just kind of a backdoor way of, answer, uh, of asking the question, and I'm out. I'm gone. I'm out. Wow. Wow. Did you, first off, can I just, did you see his legs? I saw it. I saw it. I, I've, known Car, I've known Carlton for 20 years now, and I've, that's the first time that I saw his knees. Even though we <laughs> joked frequently about him not wearing pants on the podcast. He's back. I mean, back. It's, it's, it's like, it's pandemic. It's, it's like shorts all the time. So, yeah. Whoa, Carlton. Hey, now. Stop. Stop it. I, I know. Okay. Um, that's enough. <laughs> that's all you get. This isn't basic instinct, pal. <laughs> Just calm yeah, it could have been worse, David. Role. It could have been a lot worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what? <laughs> when you're asked the question about the outrigger, that's the only thing you have that's left what you're to gonna get. to is show your legs. You're gonna you're <laughs> yeah. gonna see my legs. That's what you're gonna get. I, we're gonna I, leave it I there? would just yep. say yeah. one of the things that we've always admired about David Chase and the the Sopranos finale happened at what when we were well, when we were in the process of doing our final season. And I'll always remember Carlton and I were in New York. 
we were about to do a panel with Matt Roush, who is a, an incredible television critic and fan of television. And we were just talking before we were about to do the panel. And The Sopranos air, uh, finale had just aired. And this was before, you know, we were on Twitter or had re any real sense of what the digit what that there was a digital water cooler and so carlton and i had just been kind of raving about what how brilliant it was and then and and matt roush yeah. said oh you, you haven't heard people hate it um they're completely and totally baffled by it they thought that they're they lost the hbo feed on the cut to black and um and uh and and it, it's very divisive and carlton and i just looked at each other and in that moment we both sort of understood Oh fuck! There's no way to really do this right if if everybody it, if everyone cares so much or puts a level of expectation on on the way that a show is going to end. What does this have to do with the outrigger? David Chase refuses to talk about the ending of the of, of the Sopranos. Um, he's just basically like, "Where I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell." And so it felt like since our finale was not about not telling. In fact, we feel like we told you everything and. Um, and so the idea that there were unanswered questions about Lost, I continue to challenge any fan to say, ask us a question, we'll answer it, or we will provide you with, um, with a, a roadmap to get the answer that the show provided, like what was the deal with Walt or what do the numbers mean or please explain the polar bears or why did Jack have to fly that kite with Bai Ling? We will answer all of those questions except for one, which is the outrigger. And that we will take to our graves. That's there is where we one, draw the line. I, I will say we did write the scene. We wrote the scene that answered the question and other people outside of our writer's room have seen the scene and been sworn to secrecy. So should Carlton and I die and our memory be maligned as if we didn't know and that's why we didn't tell, that those individuals can come forward and say, now that they are dead, I will tell you who was on the outrigger, but we will have maintained our personal integrity. So that, that, that's a, there's sure. a bright side to the story. We just have to wait till you both die and we'll have all the answers <laughs> we desire. Yeah, that is true. Thank you for putting such a sunny spin on that, Josh. <laughs> and the way two, things three, are going, four, it won't two. be long. <laughs> <laughs> Pepper2342 says, uh, we've heard gossip about possible lost reboots or spinoffs and fans have mixed feelings. What do you both think about it? Would it be a good idea to go back in some kind of way nowadays? It would not be a good idea for us to go back. I mean, this comes up, you know, all the time. And I think Damon, Damon and I have been very consistent and forthright on this topic, which is we told a story that we wanted to tell. And that's, that was great. And we had an opportunity to do that. If somebody else comes along who has a great idea to do something set in the lost universe and sells that to the Walt Disney Company, uh, you know, they, they will have our blessings to do that. But we, we see no reason to do it. I mean, we, you know, it just, it doesn't feel like there's any, there's anything that we have left to say that's worth saying about, it. and we, we, we did it. Has ABC uh, just, or Disney ever come to you guys and just said, we have a pitch or they just never even Not asked? to me. Um, no. I mean, I, I've heard, I've read in the, in the, I've, I've read in the papers uh, or on the internet that, you know, past and current ABC executives have said that they're open to the idea of rebooting it, but it never, it's never, it, no one's ever come to me and said, oh, we've heard a pitch. We'd like, we'd like, to yeah. know where you being serious about allowing this thing to proceed. And I just want to say one other thing, which is, and Carlton and I talked about this a lot for the, th for the three final seasons of the show, four, five, and six, which is we put so much emotional energy into ending this show. You know, it, 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 in, in the middle of the third season, which is when we finally got word that they would do it. Um, but for the, even leading up to that moment, everyone in the entire world was like, it's impossible. Now through, through the lens of 2020 hindsight, in the year 2020, when shows regularly end, um, or are finite or are limited series, or we're only gonna do three seasons of this thing or whatever. But in 2004, which is when Lost started, and certainly in 2007, when we announced that it was going to end, and it still was very highly rated, um, that, that, it, it, 
they, everyone said to us, you're never, they're never going to let you end this thing. And so for us to put so much emotional energy into getting the ending and then all the creative energy in seasons four five and six of, of doing the ending the best we could to do the ending on our own terms, the way that we wanted to, it really does feel like then to turn around even 20 years later and say, well, that wasn't the ending. It was just an ending. You know, um, it feels like uh, it, it just, it, it feels wrong on every level. That, 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 but that's because it was our ending. And I agree with Carlton wholeheartedly that, that enough time has passed for an entire generation of people who grew up watching Lost to now say, hey, I'm a writer. You know, or I've got a take on this thing. I would love to see a new generation of storytellers take on the X Files or even Twin Peaks or Lost, you know, the shows that I loved. They feel like they're iconic because they were made by, you know, David Lynch or Chris Carter. Um, uh, but I, I, I think that stories can be told by anyone and anyone can take, take control of the story and make it their own vision. And that would be quite exciting. The sad news, gentlemen, is we are out of time. The good news is you have finally answered every open question about Lost. So you, there's literally no more questions to answer, obviously. So you're, you're free, is what I'm saying. Wow. wow. Thank you, Josh, for that gift. <laughs> it really is a gift. Carlton and I have to go to, go to work. Damon has to go host 12 podcasts and polish his Emmys. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. That's got to um, be a euphemism for something bad. <laughs> That was a softball for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, my thanks, gentlemen. The show just keeps getting richer and richer as the years go by. And um, I know on behalf of all the fans, we're thankful for what you contributed to pop culture. We're all still obsessed. And, um, and yeah, thanks as always for the time. Thank you, Thank guys. Thank you, Josh. I think, so, I think, I think we, we made it through that with nothing that we need to edit out. <laughs> Except for your leg.